to call the first one, the Honorable Mary Robinson, our, who was the first female president of Ireland and a former United Nations High Commissioner of Human Rights. Mary is presently the head of Realizing Rights and co-chair of the Health Worker Migration Policy Initiative. So, Mary, it is my honor to ask you to address us. Thank you, Manuel. Uh, good morning from New York. Good afternoon to those in Europe and Africa. Good evening to those in Asia. This is really very exciting. Um, I'd like to warmly welcome the participants. I understand there are about 400 who have already signed up from some 70 countries, and we have a number of centers already for this global dialogue. This is a vital conversation on a key issue. And I look forward, and I know that Francis does, to your continued contributions to this discussion. We will be listening very carefully. There are a few more important issues affecting the life and health chances of millions in our world today than the brain drain of health workers from countries which need them most. Health workers are essential for a functioning health system and therefore for the human right to health itself. Simple statistics are worth reflecting on again. Imagine living in a country with just three doctors per 100,000 people. This is Ethiopia today. Indeed, 13 African nations have fewer than five physicians per 100,000 people. Africa, as we know, suffers 25% of the global burden of disease, but has only 3% of the global health workforce. The fact is that Africa is short some 800,000 doctors and nurses, and currently can train only about 10 to 30% of the skilled health workers needed. Then it loses 20,000 trained health professionals per year to migration, with up to, in some cases, 60% of doctors migrating within two years of graduation. Of course, individual health workers have the right to seek a better life through mig migration, but clearly we need to tackle the current imbalances. Indeed, the issue of health worker migration poignantly illustrates our global connectedness and our dependence on each other. It clearly points to the fact that sending and receiving countries must talk constructively and creatively about these issues, which are projected to be with us for decades to come. New policies must be devised that cross borders, that acknowledge the global nature of the issue. Between countries and even within countries, health worker migration touches on the diverse policy areas of immigration, education and training, workers' rights, ethics of recruitment and equitable delivery of health care. As Peggy Clark has already said, my colleagues and I at Realising Rights have been seeking to bring the perspectives and tools of human rights, in particular the right to health, to the problem of the brain drain of health workers from the poorest countries, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. We firmly believe that a rights-based approach is critical in addressing the human resources issue. Can I say that I'm also pleased to be here as an elder, although I was somewhat dismayed to find I was eligible to be an elder. This is an, an initiative launched under Nelson Mandela and Grasa Michel's inspiration and Archbishop Desmond Tutu's chairmanship to speak freely on global issues. We've pledged to do what we can to help ensure that the crisis of health care and promoting the right to health in developing countries is sufficiently addressed. This is one of the issues that we have identified. At our launch last July, the elders committed to support, as one of our core values, the right to health. To signal our support, the elders have declared that th this coming month, April, as the Right to Health Month, as part of our campaign, Every Human Has Rights, to commemorate the 60th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This campaign aims to reaffirm and to renew commitment to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by encouraging millions of people throughout the world to make a personal pledge to live by the principles of the Declaration. So I would encourage all of you listening to learn more about the wonderful partners who are working with us on this by going into the website www.everyhumanhasrights.org. Read the Universal Declaration and take the pledge. And you will see that it includes, in Article 25, the commitment to what we're talking about here, 
It says everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and his family, including medical care, what we now call the highest attainable standard of health. It's recognized, as many of you know, in several major human rights instruments, including the preamble of the Constitution of the World Health Organization, in the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, in the Convention for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, and the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and in many, many regional organizations and national constitutions. And we recall that at the beginning of this century, the world's leaders made specific commitments which could move us towards greater respect for the right to health around the world, a right which is in essence about ensuring that effective health systems are in place and accessible to all. The United Nations Millennium Development Goals include, as you know, having those in extreme poverty and hunger, and I so agree with Francis. This is a movement which is as important as any movement, the movement against slavery, the fight against apartheid, the concern now about climate change, but we have to have this movement that tackles the inequities, the divides, the poverty in our world.